Hey fun fans, Tyler here. For this awesome FRC deep dive, we're going to have an exclusive YouTube giveaway for a 254 t-shirt during the rest of August. All you have to do is be a YouTube subscriber and leave a comment on the video of your favorite 254 robot. You can enter once for each of the 254 deep dive videos, so make sure you comment below. 254, I think a lot of people, and this is a question we got asked a lot, is how is 254 even organized? How many students? How many mentors? What makes up 254? Okay, uh, so our main, our team is kind of based around our leadership team, which is kind of divided up into two parts, I would say. Like there's a few technical leaders, like you see the FRC technical director, the FRC technical leads, uh, and you see our software director. Then there are um, a bunch of non-technical leaders to manage aspects of the teams like public relations, finance, documentation, web development, business development. Um, so that like lets us um, spread, cover all the aspects of the team. Uh, for each of these leaders, um, they usually reach out to a faculty moderator or mentor to get advice for their respective sections. Um, also for this, we, um, assign students to each sub team, which for all the non-technical aspects of the team. So you can see like there's like sub teams for business development, documentation, and etc. And that makes us that makes sure all those aspects are covered. However, we don't like allocate students towards technical aspects, and we kind of let them float around so that they can really find what they're interested in. Yeah, and that's how our team's organized. Yeah, and it's interesting to see that, like, I think what a lot of people realize is that there's something that is just this magical little thing, right, that makes it work. And it's just really, it's a consistency, and it's just having a good plan out there a lot of times, right? Yeah. Um, what happens, like, what, I really think that having the sub teams around the non-technical aspects of the team keeps us consistent in all aspects. Like, I feel like it's, we'll always remember to get the robot out by six weeks, but <laughs> we have those non-technical sub teams to make sure that we get that Woody Flowers essay in, or we make sure our team shirts are ready for competition. Well, let's talk a little bit about, uh, uh, funding for your team where does your funding come from i think you know the stereotype that i think 254 gets a lot in the community is like oh just nasa pays for like literally every single little thing right but you guys do a lot still in regards to bringing in funds so can you kind of give us a breakdown on, on how that works on 254 yeah so we're definitely um still we were founded by nasa so um we definitely still have roots with nasa but a lot of our funding is brought in through sponsorships from outside um entities so um the we kind of get sponsorships in three main ways. And the first I would say is grant writing. And what we do is we uh, apply for grants at companies in our area and across pretty much California. And we uh, write essays talking about what we do and um, our past success. And um, they're, they're able to, uh, they, it goes through a decision process whether they want to um, give us um, a sponsorship or not. And then uh, the next um, aspect of our sponsorship is that, um, we get, we're fortunate to be in the Silicon Valley, so obviously there are a lot of technological companies in the area who'd be more than happy to um, give over um, uh, to help sponsor um, first robotics teams. So um, we leverage a lot of the companies that our parents and mentors work at to see if the, those companies would be interested in sponsoring us. And um, the last kind of sponsor that we get is in-kind sponsors. So um, actually within uh, the area, pretty much within... Um, very close to our school. We have a lot of in-kind sponsors that do welding and um, anodizing and powder coating for us. And we've built over, we've built up relationships with them over years that um, have made it so that like we're able, they're um, do a lot of the work for us and we're have very good relationships so we can get stuff in and out really quickly. Um, one example of that was like actually this year we were working on our suction climber and um, a couple of days before champs, uh, we had to redesign a huge portion of it. Um, 
we we actually had the Saturday we were leaving on Tuesday. Saturday we realized it didn't really work, so we completely mm. went to the drawing board and uh, we reached out to our uh, anodizer and they got it. Um, whatever we remanufactured, they got it to us like within a day. So we're able to like really rely on the in kind sponsors because we've been using that for so long. And um, the reason we're able to uh, retain sponsors and people are like interested in sponsoring us is that we have a whole list of sponsorship perks. So um, we give them advertising through our website and our robot, and, as well as um, they uh, get on team promotional materials, which is like uh, t-shirts and other things. And um, we, we also, if, um, depending on the amount, they can re uh, request our robot for corporate events and stuff like that. So how does how does that work for the corporate events? Like, do you have a certain calendar you put out, or like, is, do you, who organizes all that? I guess. Um, we it's just based on whatever company they can um, request to us, and then we'll we'll plan that at um, whatever whatever they want and try and make it work within our schedule. Sure. And when you, when you look at the the benefits, and you guys kind of have this this tier thing, right? So it kind of like includes this plus this, right? Um, what what made you come up with like the amounts on there? So like you go 1,000, 5,000, 5,000 plus, uh, how, how are those amounts determined? Uh, I mean, that's basically like a, a need based thing. So we can't fit, um, like everybody on, you know, the, the back of the shirt or, or, you know, on those higher level tiers. So we pretty much figure out, um, you know, we, we looked at past sponsors, like we, we came up with this scheme back in like maybe 2014, looking at past sponsors where people lied and then breaking them up into a category that would maximize the amount of return for our sponsors while also not diluting um, that sponsor's recognition relative to others. Sure. So that's how we came up with those numbers. Uh, that makes uh, a lot of sense, uh, definitely for that. So, uh, something to, to ask about is in regards to uh, your students. Uh, first, uh, how many how many students, how many mentors do you have on your team, and then how does your team kind of handle uh, training and bring in new students onto two fifty four? Okay, I'll take. Yeah, I'll take. Okay, um, so our official roster last year contained about one hundred and sixty students, but. Keep in mind that is split between our FRC and VEX teams. Sure. I would say um, maybe 80 would be participating in FRC. We bring about 40 to Worlds. So educating our team members is something we're definitely still working on and still trying to improve. But there's a few things that we do that um, most of the time tend to work out. Um, we do have a lot of projects in the fall. We usually have a new member prototyping challenge. Like for, I remember when I was a freshman, they got like this giant playground ball. And then I guess it was like inspired by the stronghold shooter. And they said, design a shooter for this. Like, um, so we do have those prototyping challenges for new members. Um, it kind of gives them a way into the season. Like on the first day, they'll start prototyping. So it gives the new members something meaningful they can do during the season. Um, one thing we've been doing in the past two years is we've been building a separate off-season robot. Um, you can see our Swerve robot um, that we brought to one competition last year. So that extended time frame to work on a robot like gave a lot of new students um, opportunities to work on the robot. But um, they otherwise got in the six week super high time pressure build season. Uh, we yeah, also specifically here in this photo that um, Tyler brought up, we can see on the far right our 2018 competition robot. And then in the middle is the new swerve bot that was worked on by um, maybe some of the more like sophomore, junior. Uh, year students, but then the robot on the left was our practice bot, which was basically um, rebuilt and tuned and um, got brought up to competition speed um, by a team of entirely freshmen with minimal guidance. So I think that if you are a team that has uh, the resources, as we do, we you know we take that privilege um, and try to apply it as much as we can. And in this case. We use the fact that we have these old robots to let 
our students um, really, you know, dive in feet first and uh, try and, you know, fix the robot and, and see if they can get it running again. So I'd be remiss. I think we'll talk about this later, but uh, I, a lot of people are freaking out about uh, 254 mentioning Swerve in the first place, right? Uh, so we'll get into this a little bit later, chat. Don't worry uh, about some of the things with Swerve, but I know there's a couple other things we'll, we'll be showing with it as well, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, going on about all the off-season tournaments, we definitely try to involve new members a lot more, as you saw that robot. we like Even for the competition robot, we open up our pit crew to, like, maybe like 10 people who are like rotating in general, the off season is our time to expand like the competition season. I think one thing that really helped us prep new members last year was having more off seasons. Usually we end up going into like one or two off season. Last year we went to three. Uh, I think that really helped out. Uh, How many are you doing of- this season or this summer? Um, we have signed up for two. We're planning for three again. So you guys, have, you guys have Chessy, Chessy Champs, and what else uh, are you doing? Uh, we have applied for Capital City Classic, and uh, we're planning to go to Madtown also. Awesome. I know that hasn't come up yet. Well, um, let's kind of transition to, into that a little bit. So, uh, you guys, uh, obviously you go to off seasons and you have a lot of things going on with that. Uh, how about, how about things in regards to other stuff you do during off seasons? Uh, of course, outreach, I think Chessy champs is a big thing, obviously, right? Cause you guys put that on. Uh, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, other things you guys do during the off season to keep your team going. Yeah. Uh, so during the off season, obviously, um, the first thing that we do is, um, with Chessy champs. And I like to think as Chessy champs as having like, three opportunities for impact. The first one is the actual tournament itself. So uh, if you're not aware of what it is, is um, every September we host a off season tournament at our school. And we usually, uh, it's an invitational and we get about 42 teams to come. And um, this is really great because it's obviously in the new school year. So teams had the opportunity to incorporate new members into their team and kind of get used to um, graduating seniors that maybe being there and training their new drive team. Um, and so from this event, we're able to like reach out to like 40 more, 40, about 40 teams and have them uh, get excited for the next season. But the other way that we um, use Chessy Champs to impact more teams is um, the first way is we've um, uh, made our Chessy Champs AV, um, AV materials, um, audiovisual like uh, materials available to other off season teams within the California area. And, um, uh, that that makes it so that other teams can at a very low, relatively low cost compared to what a normal event would be, um, provide like a high a level regional style event um, for themselves. And the other way is through Cheesy Arena, which is our open source um, uh, FMS system. And this is like super easy to use. And um, we, we call it, it's the FMS that just works. Um, and that's mainly available um, through uh, and I know for a fact, like a lot of off season uh, events that I've watched on live streams use it. So it's a great opportunity for us to kind of have the impact throughout the first community that we can help so many other off season events. Um, the other way that we um, do outreach as an off season is through our technical release. And what we do is we clean up all of our technical binder and our code. And uh, you can actually check it out. We recently re- we released it on Saturday on Chief Delphi. Mm-hmm. So go ahead and check that out. Um, and the reason we do this is like, um, I know, uh, WPI lib, um, in their, um, code repository, they have a quote that says, uh, we seek to, um, uh, raise the floor, not lower the ceiling. And, uh, what I like to do, think we're doing with, uh, by releasing all this stuff is that we're raising the floor and raising the ceiling so that we can keep on growing the competition and allow for other teams to build upon our success and, uh, kind of use some of the materials that we were able to use. Uh, create during the season uh, to help them and raise the level of competition for everyone. So two things I want to, I want to ask a little anecdotal thing is that officially you are calling it uh cheesy arena, not Chessy arena. Is that correct? Yeah. It, uh, so it's Chessy chance, but most of our other stuff is cheesy. So is there any differentiator between that at all? Uh, one's more of a meme. All right. Fair enough. So, 
<laughs> um, and then in this uh, te- technical binder uh, that you release, I know you also uh, release the uh, your code as well too to GitHub uh, as well. But can you do you mind discussing a couple things that are uh, specific in this technical binder that somebody could look for to really uh, that stand out? You're like, hey, I think I really do think a team could learn a lot from something like this. Yeah. So um, what we go through is like um, on our first couple of weeks, we talk about strategy. So we talk about kind of the specific game goals that um, that allowed us to come to the final conclusion that was our robot. So and then um, later on, it goes through the not only the technical details of the um, of each subsystem, but also kind of the design processes that went into um, getting to that final design. And um, like one of the, a lot of teams um, have reached out to us asking for our CAD files, but we generally don't share that. Um, instead, we share our technical binder because we find that um, oftentimes uh, people change our CAD and go back to a previous design that we have that we decided wouldn't work for specific reasons. So um, it's more important to us that we share our design process rather than our final design because uh, we feel that that benefits the community more. Have you guys uh, seen anybody try to actually fully copy a robot? I know I was in China a couple of years ago, and there was uh, other bots that were almost like aesthetically looked exactly like your robot. Have you guys seen that in the wild before? Uh, yeah, at Madtown Throwdown last year, uh, thirteen twenty three, um, they they competed a second robot that was a lockdown copy. Um, that's the one. Yeah, there seen. were multiple multiple lockdown copies last year, and. There weren't that many um, misfire copies from 2017 because that one I think was harder to replicate. There were, of course, the famous 2014 mm-hmm. clones. You know, after Barrage, we saw Guy Stalker from Team 973 um, and a couple other, uh, you know, fun robots. I think the the times when the robot gets copied is when the architecture itself is what is what is what makes the robot so good sure. because. Even the details are still hard to replicate, the manufacturing tolerances, the controls algorithms and the tuning on the code and the counterbalancing. But architecture decisions, like I could talk about why the 2018, you know, intake and carriage and elevator were positioned the way they were. Um, but those are really, I think, the key things that, that teams do copy. But what we encourage is instead of just, you know, like if we sent out the cat and they just straight up pulled the dimensions and started fabbing, they wouldn't understand why we made the decisions that we did. And also, more importantly, just because it's on the competition robot doesn't mean it's perfect. And just because we're 254 doesn't mean everything we do is correct. So there's a lot of times that like we overvalue aesthetics when it's functionally um, less performance, or we have some extra packaging constraint that other teams don't have to deal with because we have you know, uh, attention to side panels for or something like that. So those are instances where if teams take the fundamentals and build up the design, they will not only develop their own skills and learn better, but they'll also likely result at a, at a better product than if they had just outright copied us. So we're going to, we're going to get a bit more into, uh, as we transition to the kickoff and strategy and that sort of thing. But I think something you said really hits the nail on the head there is that, uh, not everything 254 does is perfect, right? It's all about iteration. It's all about, you know, going through that journey, which we'll learn more about here as well. But, you know, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of teams out there uh, where they just see that and they, they, they kind of put you up on this golden pedestal a little bit, right? And it, it, a, lot, a lot of teams, I don't think, fully think through the processes that had to get you there in the first place. It's not like you just snap your fingers and a golden robot shoots out of your butt or something like that, right? It's it's one of those things where, you know, we're and this is exactly what we're going to learn about. So let's go into kickoff here. Uh, about some of these processes. So why don't you walk us through kickoff? How do you approach kickoff? Uh, you mentioned a little bit before that you, sh- you know, as in you shared some in the technical binder, uh, but uh, but what do you do in regards to uh, uh, what you do to make sure you're successful each season? Okay, briefly in terms of like our schedule, we watch the game animation, watch everything live. Um, then we have like a team kickoff to discuss like logistics with like the parents and everybody. Then um, we break out into strategy groups. As you can see on one of the pages in our tech binder, if you, okay, that's, um, so basically what that is, is we just like break into groups of students and discuss what we think would be important in small groups. So I think that lets like each student like 
have something meaningful to say, which they probably wouldn't be able to say in a group of like 80 people at our kickoff. Um, another thing, okay, after that, we go through all the rules. Then only we start uh, like putting down what we want our robot to be able to do. So one thing I think we do successfully during kickoff is we don't miss mix the discussion of strategy and design. So deciding what we want our robot to do, we don't like start to decide uh, like what how we're gonna design it. So I think that gives us some clarity in how we are going to how how we want to design our robot. Um, yeah, and after so that, to give, Daniel, to give an example there, um, one of the things that we did with the 2019 season was we made decisions early on, such as we really want the ability to score out of both sides. We really want the ability to uh, score around opponents and through heavy defense. And it was those decisions that led us down the path of this turreted or elevator on a turret with a double jointed arm and that is quite a bit different architecture than if you had say um a two-stage elevator with a large intake that could invert um and go through the back there were a couple teams that went with that architecture there were teams that went with a telescoping arm like a classic um 233 pink arm you know there's, there's a bunch of different architectures that all could meet the same strategy goal um and then there's other times where you get a different architecture because you had a different strategy goal. So I would look at someone like, um, you know, 1678, who decided that, you know, in, inverting and, and all that was um, not as high a priority. And so they had the climbing as their priority and they went down a totally different architecture. Yeah, to add on to that, like once we get like some requirements, like on the sheet, on the picture that you showed earlier, there was like little requirements on what like what are our must haves and what are nice to haves and other things that we might want to explore. Um, so guided by that, we on kickoff we start prototyping things like intakes or things that are that would change that are not like super critical to the robot full the full robot architecture. So that lets us. Put down some stuff that will drive the complete design later. So when you guys get uh, essentially done, like how long does this process take for us? Are you done with this after kickoff weekend? Is this continually uh, changing throughout the build season? How do you how do you approach that? Okay. What I just described was our Saturday, and like we would start, yeah, yeah like at about like seven o'clock p.m. on Saturday would probably start prototyping, like deciding what we want to prototype in. I'm oh, sorry, say that Getting one more time. You said that. at 7 p.m. Saturday, you guys are prototyping already, right? Uh, yeah, for like, or at least deciding what we have to prototype. Like this year, yeah. I remember at like, by the end of Saturday, we already had like, we explored like using the Velcro rollers to pick the discs off the ground. Um, we, we started our prototypes by Saturday. Yeah. There is one thing though. <laughs> um, we are quite good at starting prototyping. I will say that, yeah. you know, every team has a weakness. One mm -hmm. of our weaknesses is knowing when to stop. <laughs> we usually will spend um, upwards of three weeks prototyping intakes because it's usually the most complicated subsystem to get right. And that is only possible because we have the ability to manufacture and design extremely fast once we've locked in an architecture and a geometry that is optimal. So for example, um, we released our 2018 blog and mm -hmm. in there you can skim through and see um, all the different intakes we went through to try to grab these cubes uh, you know, up on their side, laying down. And by the end, we ended up effectively getting some help from uh, Team 1323 that pointed us down a different path. And in a matter of one weekend, we completely rebuilt our intake to this new architecture. We took their, you know, their design and kind of revived it and, and improved a lot of elements to make it more compact. Um, and by the end of that, we had 
our intake. So although we spent three weeks prototyping, we knocked out the final comp bot in one weekend um, wow. and, and just locked it in. Something uh, I think we'll get into this in a little bit as well, too. And don't worry, chat. Free shirts are coming soon. Settle down a little bit. Uh, and as we're going to get into, we have two more things to go through, by the way, uh, scouting uh, and some different attributions. But I think something that you guys mentioned a lot, and we find this amongst a lot of the other teams, is, is how teams network with each other, right? And it's not like this is just you're off doing this on your own, but you're continually talking to other teams to get their input and their opinions so you can, can continue to iterate and make things better. Of course, you you know learn and fail on, by yourself a lot of times, too, but... Uh, teams, I'm telling you right now, if you are not talking to other teams uh, to try to iterate and try to learn from them and find out what's working for them, what's not working for them, you need to get out there and start doing that. That is an invaluable thing uh, to start learning and building your team and making it better is to learn from others as well. Uh, so I, I do want to move on uh, here as well, too, uh, and kind of jump in. We're not going to get into everything about your robot this year. We just don't have the time. Uh, of course, go look at the technical binder. I think that explains a lot of it right in the GitHub code. Uh, so you can find that on Cheat Delphi. Uh, but let's talk about scouting a little bit. I think this is something we've had a lot of people, uh, a lot of our audience asked before the show is about your scouting. Uh, looking at this, what do you gather for information? How do you scout? Give us just a full breakdown. What's going on with scouting on 254? Yeah, definitely. So uh, this year we decided, um, especially for champs, uh, since there was enough data, to start scouting ahead of the event. So one thing that we did was we started pre-scouting. And uh, what we did was um, we uh, would have students at Build um, go ahead and um, look at, uh, watch matches of previous um, te or of teams that are going to be in our division, uh, watch previous matches of them. And just kind of give a, a ELO, and we develop an ELO ranking ahead of the time of uh, how we think their driver skill is, just based on the impression of our scouters. And um, the so that's done ahead of the event, and that's separated from like competition ELO. Um, so I'll, I'll go straight into uh, match scouting. Uh, how match scouting works is this year um, we uh, developed an Android app, on, and basically you can go through the entire. Um, entire you have one student watching one robot per match and uh they just uh click buttons uh logging what they do and uh we it stores that locally on the device and then once we get back to the hotel we have all six tablets and they upload it on uh to the central server the other um half of scouting is pit scouting um so how pit scouting works is um we don't really get like robot abilities because um it, it's uh it doesn't always uh happen in real matches what like even what um most teams say including us so um uh we we always try to just get just uh what their drive base is what their uh programming language is because um if we're in alliance with them and they need help we want to be able to um help them with that oh that's and, really um, cool that's a great idea yeah. I love that uh the biggest thing is um None of our, none of us are the programmers on our team are really experienced with lab views, so um, that's really a big thing. So, um, and then uh, we get information from that. And at the scouting meeting, we, um, oh, what you see here is a full team profile that we build on each team. Uh, I w we always make our team profile a joke, so you can see uh, that's uh, our our head mentor segue. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, we basically collect uh, all this different match info. And we're able to sort it in a statistics page and uh, develop the, our pick list. And how our pick list works is um, it's not we, we're not always trying to pick just the like highest ranked teams. Um, what we uh, decide early on in the uh, scouting meeting is more like what we want each pick of our, our alliance partner, our uh, alliance to like what's uh, what purpose they serve. So like for example, in 2018, we were looking for another scale bot. So that we could handle the our opponent's alliance switch, and then uh, for our third and fourth pick, pick someone that could handle our alliance's switch and exchange. So stuff like that, and then we develop tiers of robots that we want to pick, um, and then that gets that information gets relayed to our the person who goes to um, alliance selections, and we're able to make uh, great alliances off of that. Something I want to follow up with you on is that you mentioned that the data from your scouting uh, devices does not get dumped until you get back to the hotel. Is that correct? Yeah. So okay. our, 
what well, our uh, tablets do have like LTE and stuff, but it's not always great at certain events. Yeah. Um, well, what, and we what, can't what rely gonna, on event Wi-Fi. What I'm, so. I'm going to ask is that. Uh, do you do anything for for like strategy then, like during qualification rounds? Like obviously you'll have the data as you get oh. into elims, right? But what do you do in regards to statistics then for qualification? Is that all the pre mat scouting? Yeah, so we have a um, we we use pre mat scouting and also um, just uh, like uh, notes that um, we have a strategy team that's also watching the matches and just taking out notes on what they've noticed from previous events and any matches that they've seen of this team. And then uh, they're really devising like strategies. Mm -hmm. And then once we get into uh, a line selection, they have a better um, idea of what strategies teams are. Or once we get to our scouting meeting, they have a better idea of what strategies teams are using at that specific event and can therefore develop like specific strategies um, that will counteract that. So like one example was like on Einstein this year, um, we were having like, uh, we were facing pretty heavy defense so what we had was like uh, every cycle, uh, 3310 and us, we would switch sides of the field to throw the defenders off and stuff like that, that um, we, our strategy team really works hard on to um, help the drive team um, just uh, perform the best that they can during the match. Yeah, makes a ton of sense for that. Uh, obviously, a lot of cool stuff. Uh, we did get some questions about scouting that we'll ask a little bit later uh, as well, too. I think a lot of people just want to uh, ask a just real brief yeah. question. Is it going to be made available publicly, or is it open sourced or anything like that? Uh, not currently, and we generally um, do not release our scouting um, information. That's not something that we, we're considering right now. All right, we're One gonna, other thing about the, the qualification match strategy that, I, that Sumi kind of brought up um is that one thing specifically with qualification matches random partners random opponents oftentimes pre-scouting and trying to um, extrapolate what you think is going to happen in that match uh doesn't always end up being it ends up being extra uh, uh, inaccurate when we are on the field because not only do we have we know who our coach is and our coach's ability to you know have a strategy with our alliance that we believe can elevate um, the individual performances of our own alliance, but we also believe that teams play better when they're against us. They play heavier defense, they're more focused, they score harder, they see blue, and they get red in the eyes. So it's <laughs> it's just, you know, something that you can't um, always account for, and that's why we have such an emphasis on driver practice, in-match uh, stra strategy decisions on the fly, having contingencies. You can't always go into every match assuming you know how it's going to play out, especially in the qualifications. That's fair. Um, last thing we're going to wrap up uh, with a little bit here is just asking about uh, looking at kind of what makes your team – like if you had to attribute something, you're like this is what makes our team work so consistently and so successfully, give me one thing that it would be, maybe two. Two words that are one word. All right. Capri Sun. Capri Sun. Capra Sun. <laughs> two two words. Strawberry Kiwi. Okay. This Ooh. is the secret sauce to 254. Disregard that Mountain Dew. Specifically was, Strawberry Kiwi, huh? Yeah, the Mountain Dew, that was someone's first try. No, but the but the the strawberry kiwi, we stock up. Okay. We have <laughs> A secret stash that sits right behind Travis Covington's computer. Only the mentors know about that one. Oops, sorry, kids. And then we have a couple others that are hidden away. There's some that live on top of the CNC, so you have to be above um, six foot three, which is Corn McBride's height, to be able to reach those. And as long as we, you know, have enough Capra Sun to keep uh, the mentors happy and, yes. and the students happy on the long nights, we'll we'll have a successful season. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent.